And a very, very warm welcome to everyone. Welcome back to our Bite-Sized Corrosion 2021 Summer School. We do hope that you find today's session and our subsequent discussions of some benefit. We do really love to have your questions, so do send them to us and we'll try and address it next time. Now, talking about questions, we actually received one overnight, but before we address it, I just want us to have a quick summary of what we discussed yesterday. Yesterday, Neil and I were discussing the SIPS technique, where essentially you're taking pipe potentials, not just at test posts, but at close intervals or really close to each other along the entire length of the pipeline. And that gives us a picture of the pipeline protection. And during the process, you're actually tethered to the chamber so that you have your pipe connection and your pipe contact. Now, Neil, here's a question that came in. How can you be certain that you are taking potentials along the pipeline itself and that you haven't wandered away somewhere into the wilderness? The, the easiest way to tell is that if you are working on a water pipeline, then you walk from chamber to chamber because the chambers on a water pipeline are situated immediately over the pipeline. So that's relatively simple. Interestingly, we had a challenge a few years ago where a pipeline went through some mealy fields and the, the crop had not been harvested. And so the millies were well over my head and I'm not the shortest person around. <laughs> and for that, we actually took a cheap, we knew the GPS locations of the chambers. So we plotted a route of the pipeline on a GPS and had the GPS along with the lead surveyor. And he was able to follow the route on the GPS. On fuel and gas lines, it's not so easy because you don't have chambers every 500 meters or so. In that situation, you may well have pipe markers, but pipe markers are not necessarily always over the pipeline. Often you find that the pipeline markers are offset. When you get to the marker, you see, oh, pipeline 13 meters west, and you realize you haven't been walking over the pipe. So that can have quite a significant effect on the, the SIPs results. Mm -hmm. um, it's not so as significant on the off potentials because you haven't got the current flow in the ground, but it does certainly give you erroneous and more averaged on potentials if you stray off the pipeline. So a lot of surveys actually require you to use a pipe locator up front to ensure that you are in fact on the pipeline, but it doesn't really matter which, which method you use as long as you do ensure that you are over the top of the pipe. Great, thanks, Neil. Yeah, we do want to make sure that we are investigating our pipes and not, as you say, not just the milli fields. Now, yesterday we discussed the SIPS technique and today we're going to spend a little bit of time looking at the DCBG survey. I remember when I was new in the industry and attended a conference, gosh, must have been in the, within the first year or, or less, and someone spoke about this DCBG survey. And I struggled so much just to get the letters to roll off my tongue. I was so scared of saying it wrong. It did actually help when someone explained that DCVG stood for a DC voltage current gradient technique. So Neil, the name's a good place to start. What is the DCVG survey and how does it work? Well, I think the critical word in the DCVG is in the, the term gradient. The main difference between the SIP survey where we're measuring pipeline potentials and the gradient, the DCVG and other um, systems where we are measuring gradients is that we do not have a pipe connection for measuring the gradient. If you look at this photograph, you can see here that you've got an operator with two electrodes and he is measuring the potential difference between the two reference electrodes. And that potential difference is in fact then a gradient that is in the soil. And that gradient is caused by current that is flowing in the soil. The earth is a, a great big three-dimensional resistance. And so if you make contact with the earth at two different points and there is current flow in the earth, then you're going to pick up a potential difference between those two points. When you then 
look at what those potential differences might be. And credit here to uh, Beichmann and Schwenk, cathodic corrosion control for this diagram. You can see that in the bottom left-hand corner here, it shows you two reference electrodes, mm -hmm. which are both situated in this particular case over the top of the pipe. And the difference between the two reference electrodes, which is the <coughs> potential gradient, is reflected in this top graph where you see that as you go across a defect, which is here in the middle, you get this characteristic S-curve across the defect. In this particular situation, the uh, graphs represent the potentials caused by differences in the pipeline environment where the, the defect itself is maybe anodic and the rest of the pipe is cathodic. And this is what we would normally call long cell activities on a pipeline, which is not necessarily under cathodic protection. If you were to place the two electrodes at right angles to the pipe, instead of parallel to the pipe, then over here you can see that the Germans use the, the term U for potential. And you can see the little perpendicular sign, and you get this characteristic single peak if you are measuring what is called the lateral gradient or the gradient at right angles. And so the DCVG, the direct current voltage gradient, is a technique for measuring these gradients in the soil. And this photograph then, again, one of Brian's excellent illustrations, shows the gradient that is associated now with a defect under cathodic protection conditions where the current is flowing from remote earth towards a defect that is in the coating of the pipe. The circular lines represent equipotential gradient lines, and the two straight lines indicate the direction of current flow towards the defect. And the operator then with these two electrodes actually then measures the difference between two points on the ground and can pick up the gradient. The shape of the gradient can then be traced. As you can see that in the center here, when the guy is sitting immediately over the top of a defect, there is no difference between the left-hand and right-hand poles. On the left-hand side, the further pole will be sitting more negative. On the right-hand side, the further pole will be sitting more negative to the right-hand side. And so you get this characteristic situation where the gradient actually leads you to the location of the defect. Now, you may say, well, how do I know what causes that gradient? Mm -hmm. And in order to make the survey effective, we then impress a current onto the pipeline so that it creates a gradient. And this may be additional gradient over and above a CP system, or it may be just switching the CP system. And this short high current pulse is then reflected by a change in the meter and in the jargon, it's called the flick. And you literally follow the flick, if you'll excuse the expression. So when you're looking at the meter, it's a center zero meter, so the meter normally sits on zero. And when you get one of those DC pulses, it will flick either to the right or to the left. And that indicates in which direction you're going to find this defect. Okay, thanks, Neil. So it's important, just looking at your photographs, that the operator has the two probes on the ground simultaneously, because otherwise he can't measure the potential difference between them. I think for me, that's something to get into my head because in the SIP survey, you're measuring pipe to soil potential and here you're measuring, what would it be, probe to probe potential in a sense. That's absolutely right, yeah. So actually, you don't need to have the probes in contact with the soil all the time. You can actually pick the probes up and move and then put them down again. But then right. you only take a measurement when the probes are both in contact with the soil. Right. Yes. And you've got to make very sure that the probes are correctly aligned with the instrument. Otherwise, a right-hand flick is going to land up with you heading off to the left 
and you're not going to be able to follow things. Neil, you mentioned that you could use your rectifier or you could impress a current over that, but can you do a DCVG if you don't have cathodic protection? Oh, for sure, because okay. the DCVG signal is just a direct current uh, that you are applying to the pipe. It doesn't matter whether the pipe has cathodic protection or not. You can use a battery, you can use a generator, you can use a CP system. Sometimes you don't even need to switch the CP system off. You can actually just increase the output of the CP system. As long as you have this pulse that is identifiable so that you know that you are following the effect of the direct current that you have impressed on the pipe. And that direct current is then flowing from the ground towards the defects in the pipe. Uh, so that's answered sort of half my question, but I haven't asked the other half yet. And the other half is, so what if we have a sacrificial anode system? What are the risks of doing a DCVG with a sacrificial anode system on our pipe? Well, there's no risk really other than in misinterpretation because a sacrificial anode has a relatively low driving voltage. And when you impress an external voltage on the pipe, it's usually relatively high compared to the anode voltage. And so the anode will actually show up as a defect. If you're walking along a pipe and all of a sudden you find a defect three meters off to the side, it's highly likely that that will be a sacrificial anode. Right. And let's not re-excavate them all as, <laughs> as a concern. Talking about excavating, we're using the DCVG primarily to find defects um, or holes in the coating. Um, yesterday, we talked about SIPs. Am I correct in saying that the SIPs won't really tell us about coating defects? Well, indirectly, yes. The, the SIPs does indicate to us where there are coating defects because they will generally be associated with a localized reduction in protection. The, the protection level or polarized potential of the pipe. But the SIPS is not primarily a defect location technique. It is a cathodic protection evaluation technique. And the DCVG is primarily a defect location technique. So it is far more sensitive than the SIPS and far more accurate in terms of actually pinpointing the location of a defect on the surface of the ground, literally to within centimeters. So are you able to tell the significance of a defect? How big is it from your DCVG survey? Yes, you can intuitively understand that if a defect is large, it has a, a higher current flowing from remote earth towards that particular location on the pipe. So therefore, with a large defect, you would anticipate that the gradient that you measure will be larger. But equally, if you put a higher voltage on the pipe, you're also going to get a higher gradient. You can't just take the intensity of the defect itself. You have to measure it with respect to something else. And the way we do that is to measure the shift on the pipeline itself at the test posts. So one would measure the signal shift on the pipeline as a result of this asynchronous DC signal that is, that is impressed on it. And then we measure the intensity of the gradient with respect to remote earth. And the way to do that is illustrated in this photograph. So you take a remote earth could be one meter away, it could be 30 meters away. Remote Earth is not a place, it's a concept. And it's a place where there is no further change in the electrical characteristics, the potential. So here we have the, the surveyor measuring from kind of at arm's length from the center of the defect to a couple of meters away. And then he moves from there to the next one and the next one and the next one and so on until you get no further change. And then you add all of those up and you get what is called the overline to remote earth potential. As illustrated in this example, it's 27 millivolts. And then you take that and you compare that to the shift that is on the pipeline itself in terms of the pipeline potential. And that gives you what is generally termed the percentage IR. It's a term that has been coined for the industry. It stands for the percentage of the IR being volt drop that the lateral voltage gradient reflects 
compared to the actual potential of the pipe. And that then gives you a, an indication of the intensity or the size of this particular defect. Before I ask you a little bit more about defects, I just want to clarify, and, and there's been a question related to this. When we do the survey, we use the probes parallel to the pipe, and when we size them, we use the probes at 90 degrees to the pipe. Is that correct? Yes. If you think about that, that illustration of the gradient lines in the soil, they are circular around the, the pipe. So if you were to walk along the pipe with the two probes side by side, the sensitivity would be greatly reduced. So you walk along the pipe with the probes fore and aft, so to speak. Behind, behind you and in front of you, yes. Yeah, okay. yeah, until you get to the region of the defect. And then you, and then you work in two dimensions to ensure that you get to the actual epicenter of the of defect itself. Right. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, do we ever find that we can identify the shape of a, of a defect? Because I know not every defect is a beautiful round drilled hole. <laughs> you know, we like to talk about defects having a, a, a particular size or a critical size. And we think that always nice round things like uh, two rand coins or whatever. Yes, the shape of the defect can be determined by the characteristic of the gradient. So if you had a single round hole in the coating, or even a might be a fairly jagged hole, then you would get a relatively circular uniform gradient around that defect. If the defect is on top of the pipe, the gradient will be fairly sharp. If the defect is underneath the pipe, the gradient will be more spread out because it's further away from the ground surface. But this picture illustrates a real conundrum because this scratch is a long defect. And you may say, well, how on earth do you get a long scratch like that? Well, um, I, I'm not casting aspersions at anybody, but here's a scratcher. This guy is compacting backfill along the side of the pipe. And if that machine was to impact the side of the trench, which fortunately he didn't in this example, you would land up with a long scratch. What if you had an excavator working on the backfill a reinstatement and he didn't control his uh, bucket very carefully, you could easily get one of the teeth of the bucket impacting the pipe and you would never know about it until you come along and do this sort of survey um, that we have where you go in and do the Sherlock Holmes um, exercise. Yes. One of the most challenging examples that I had on a pipeline survey was a situation where the flick led me towards a particular point and then it disappeared. And I carried on along the pipe and about 18 meters later, the flick suddenly reappeared, leading me backwards. So there was this long section where there was no gradient and it was a strong gradient each side. When they excavated the, the, the pipeline to investigate it, they found that a particular pipe length had a scratch, Entirely. the full length of the okay. pipe, because the pipe had been dragged over the ground, over a stone or something like that, which had in fact then damaged the coating in this long, straight indication. So yes, sometimes it is possible to to tell the extent or shape of a defect if it is particularly um, unusual or characteristic. And Neil, that, that and in fact your, your comment about your, um, your own experience with, with the whole pipe length having a defect, is there ever a, a situation where you can find that the defect is too large to accurately pinpoint, which I guess in a way is yes, because that's what your experience was. But in a way, if it is so big, it, you're going to be absolutely adamant that there's a defect there. And when you dig, you're not going to miss it because it is so big. Am I correct? Yeah, because unless you disbelieve your actual readings that you get, 
the defect was in fact large, but you can always tell the extremities of the defect. So if you had a section of bare pipe, for argument's sake, let's take a, a ridiculous extremity, then um, as you approached that bare pipe, you would have a huge gradient. Over the pipe itself, you would have nothing, nothing in the close interval, but as you move further out, you will get a significant gradient. Yeah. So there's obviously some real importance with again your your operator sensitivity, whether your operator is observing the flick, because this sounds like it's quite a manual process, not really recorded. Yeah, as you saw in those earlier photographs, all you're doing is looking at a meter. And if you were, if the operator was to turn the sensitivity right down, you wouldn't see any flicks. And you That's could a then quick way to get through it. You could then survey a pipeline and say, oh no, this pipe's fine. I didn't see any defects. Well, because you had a sensitivity on five volts instead of 50 millivolts, for argument's sake. That is a challenge. You've got to have um, people that know what they're doing and know how to operate the equipment. But that goes for any survey. Always. Now we have say identified several defects on a pipeline how can we size them what what is the best way or a practical way to size the defects to know which ones are of significance and which ones we can ignore i think the standards say five percent ir or one percent ir how can we correlate that the defects on any one pipeline will be sized relative to each other in that survey at that particular point in time. And we found from practical experience that with new well applied or new high resistance coatings, uh, immediately after construction, whilst the coating in general is still, hasn't absorbed any moisture, mm. as a good insulation, you get sharp defect indications that in general, 5% is considered the limit above which you have to repair it during construction. Between 1% and 5% is generally considered as a gray area where in order to, to characterize it, you need to actually excavate a number of defects of different sizes and then decide at what level are we going to accept the, the, the defect indications as being small enough that the CP can take care of it or whether or not we need to repair them. We had a pipeline uh, 10 years ago or so where we actually had to set that limit at 0.5% because we found that the defects were fairly significant even at that very, very low percentage IR value. That's quite interesting. And the significance of really small defects, is that a problem? I mean, we talk about a small defect trapping the current as it were and being corrosion hotspot? Well, yes, it is a problem in two ways. If you do not have temporary cathodic protection during construction or subsequent permanent cathodic protection, those small defects represent very high current densities. And so although the new coatings make our lives a lot easier from a cathodic protection point of view, they actually increase the risk of penetration if you don't put cathodic protection on the pipe. Kind of a, a strange situation, but, the, but that's what we are finding. So you put the super duper coating on, relatively few defects, don't put any subsequent cathodic protection on it, and within two years, you put a hole in the pipe. And it's happening. It's happening mm -hmm. throughout the country. That's from the CP point of view. From the AC interference point of view, there's a, a critical defect size of one square centimeter that has been found to be the size that is most susceptible to AC corrosion. And so we really need to, to look at these small defects as well and be aware that if we've got small defects, then we've got to make sure that our AC mitigation systems are working, uh, as Craig spoke to us about in our Facebook a few months ago, or from the CP point of view, that we've got temporary protection in place. And just to give you an example, here's a nice picture of a small defect in a good coding system. So that is a plastic tape wrapping system. And that defect is in fact about one square centimeter. So that's of significant concern if we've got AC to be concerned about as well. Now um, we're running out of time, but I know small defects are 
or only half of the conversation because um, my experience has been that that on a number of pipelines that we've surveyed, we have really big defects often associated with chambers. I don't know if you've got any comments in that regard. Well, if chambers are properly constructed, then we don't have coating defects associated with chambers. But unfortunately, chambers are not always properly constructed. So let's go and look at our thousand words again. This is a, just an example of a chamber. And the point about this chamber is that there's a lot of reinforced concrete associated with that chamber. That reinforcing is supposed to be insulated or separated from the pipe. And you can see here that whilst these little blocks have been put in to separate the horizontal rebar, this particular one here is virtually touching the coating. And rebars move, believe it or not, in spite of all those ties, rebars move during casting of concrete. You can land up with the coating actually being damaged by the rebar, and you land up with the rebar in contact with the pipe. And this can compromise the cathodic protection completely because you've designed a CP system for a well-coated pipe, and all of a sudden you're having to deal with large areas of reinforced concrete, which are going to drain the cathodic protection and may in fact cause the pipe to be unprotected in that area. It's also important that the rebar is not in contact with the pipe from a potential measurement point of view. This is a picture of a valve chamber under construction where the test point is attached to the blank flange. And you can see that the reinforcing is fairly close to mm. this access stub. And then when you go to do your potential measurement, if your uh, reinforced concrete is in contact with the pipe, that potential measurement is going to be erroneous. When you attach to the test point, and you have a reference electrode in the ground right next to the chamber. If that chamber is not fully insulated from the pipe, well, you're going to get a very poor cathodic protection reading. It's going to be non-representative, firstly, and the cathodic protection on the pipe would have been compromised. Well, thanks, Neil. That's certainly a good comment to bear in mind. And in fact, I was going to say, uh, wait, there's more for next week. And you've actually led us straight in because... Next week, we'll be looking at PCM and looking at ways of finding where the current is flowing. But just with reference to yesterday and to today, we asked the question whether there was potential for conflict when we look at SIPs and DCBG. And I'm really hoping that everybody's come to the same conclusion that I have, is that they're actually answering different questions. So there's no conflict between the two survey techniques. They're answering different questions completely. SIPS tells me, do I have CP and is it working? And DCVG is telling me, do I have defects and do they need to be repaired? So I just want to say thank you, Neil, for, for chatting with us today. And thank you to everyone for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon.